I want to thank Suzanne Keenest for being here to support our webinar and introduce our presenters. Suzanne, I'm going to turn the webinar over to you so you can introduce the topic and our presenters. All right, thank you, Sean. Uh, my name is Suzanne Keenest brown and I'm the National GIS Specialist um, at the National Soil Survey Center. So today we have Joe Brennan and Chad Ferguson here to talk to us about um, raster soil surveys, um, project development, correlation, standards, and exports. So these two have been very active in um, going through the process of correlating and publishing raster soil surveys. Um, Joe Brennan is a soil data quality specialist in St. Paul, Minnesota, and he's really been at the forefront of um, not only completing, well, I would say developing and completing raster soil surveys with the offices that he works with, but also publishing them um, and particularly publishing them according to the new standards that um, were developed a couple years ago. I think Minnesota is now the first state um, to have the statewide, statewide raster soil survey published that contains um, several projects that have been completed in Minnesota. And Chad has been on the other end of helping um, apply the standards and get the, the data published um, according to those and available um, to the public. So these raster soil surveys are currently available on the uh, data gateway. So this topic of correlation um, and publication is um, something that I think people will find of great interest. There has been a lot of, um, I guess, hesitation maybe in, in how the correlation process will work with these raster soil surveys. And I've really always appreciated Joe's um, uh, perception on that as well as Dave Zimmerman before uh, he left, and that is that the workflow is really no different from uh, correlating and QAing a traditional uh, Sergo product. So I think that um, we have a lot to learn from, from Joe with that respect, and, and hopefully uh, hearing from him will help people feel more comfortable with moving forward uh, with the QA and correlation and publication of, of these raster soil surveys because we will have more and more of them coming um, in the near future. All right, so Joe and Chad, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Okay, thanks, Suzanne. Uh, I'm up first. Uh, so there are three uh, principal publications that drive the day-to-day -day work of those of us uh, working in the NCSS. And these are the Soil Survey Manual, the National Soil Survey Handbook, and the Soil Taxonomy. And uh, recently, within the last couple of years, digital soil mapping and rational soil surveys have been acknowledged as part of the fabric of the NCSS. So it's really a, this process is a, they really tipped our hat to us. So within the, uh, the manual, uh, chapter five was dedicated to digital soil mapping, and it was published in 2017. It, in my mind, it provides a very comprehensive overview of digital soil mapping, and it covers uh, the fundamentals of spatial data, particularly suited towards rasters, going over topics such as digital data types, projection systems, resolutions, and even takes a brief look at the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum. It also introduces project management, including the importance of organization, the pre-processing of data, um, which are things like filling sinks and atmospheric corrections, as well as data exploration of terrain derivatives and spectral indices that are created in the workflow. For prediction, it familiarizes, familiarizes readers on different sampling types, uh, as well as class, different classification methods and statistical modeling techniques. And something new for us in soil mapping is accuracy and uncertainty for validating our work. And, Digital soil mapping gives us an opportunity to communicate these metrics, and it's something that we haven't been able to do in the past, so it's, it's a, a pretty neat thing, in my opinion. Uh, within the, uh, the soil survey handbook, uh, the content is very institutional. It really outlines how digital soil mapping and raster soil surveys fit within the frame of what we, what we already have built. How does it fit within our walls? 
working definition and purpose are provided. The different types of rational soil survey products are discussed, and these include project mapping, which could either be MLRA update type work as, as well as initial soil surveys, and a continuous properties mapping effort. The handbook identifies project requirements, such as project plans and approvals, discusses data structures, and identifies things such as file naming conventions, data formats, as well as um, where the rational soil surveys will live once they're, or where they will, where they will be published to. And finally, it, it addresses the responsibilities of the members, the interested parties of the members of the National Cooperative Soil Survey. Uh, these publications, like in my opinion, they provide a, a structure or a tunnel for us to walk through while completing a rational soil survey project. I think what's very important to, to note with what you get out of these two publications is that there's no cookbook. And there isn't really a, uh, a standard template as to how you're going to get things done. How any project gets done uh, from A to B will likely be different from, from every project. And also importantly are that standards are dynamic, are dynamic for all topics within the handbook. And seeing as though only a handful of projects, of raster soul survey projects have been, have been completed to date, undoubtedly we're going to have many changes to our standards in the future. Uh, now I'm going to pass the line over to Joe, who's going to demonstrate a raster soul survey project workflow with a little more detail than what you would find in a traditional uh, soul survey public, or in what you saw in the previously mentioned publications. All right. Well, thanks, Chad. Um, so I'm going to go back to uh, Chapter 5 of the Soil Survey Manual. And uh, we should see how it provides a general workflow for these uh, digital soil mapping projects. And while every project is going to be unique in many ways, uh, these are going to be the steps that we're going to use in producing raster soil surveys. So. Um, Going a step further, I'm going to cover how this outline can shape the way we manage and document projects really within our current mold of MLRA business. Um, DSM projects seem to have a more complex sequence of steps than our traditional mapping projects. So um, a few of us with the uh, focus team were, uh, were put together an outline of uh, 35 smaller milestones that can nest into the eight stages uh, listed in the manual. And I've attached a sequence of these draft milestones in Adobe uh, just for you to take a look at. Uh, this is nothing official. This is just uh, uh, kind of a working document. But, uh, and, and as you can see, most of these milestones aren't in NASIS. And I think the long list indicates that it's going to take some effort for us to, to adapt. Um, but Generally, I think all projects can be broken down into a beginning development phase, and then there's going to be a second phase where all the work is going to be done, and then there's going to be the later phases where we go through the motions to, to deliver uh, products of quality. And today I'm, I'm going to be skipping the implementation phase where more exciting work in the field and uh, our applied modeling is done and instead focus on considerations and approaches uh, from, from a few lessons learned through uh, project work. And I'll try to emphasize the milestones uh, closer to the beginning and the end of the project. So I think there's a, a reasonable desire to want to evaluate methods on small areas or with uh, specific issues, um, but that shouldn't prevent us from grouping up concepts or concepts above uh, one specific correlation issue uh, to organize the, our work towards uh, seamless soil survey with the MLRA approach. And I think most MLRAs are probably going to be too complex to design a two-year field project to address uh, all issues. I think that's a reasonable assumption. But there probably is somewhere between general soil map units and, and the land resource unit level of detail that may provide an effective, like an effective bounding area for us to develop our projects. And even if a project seems too ambitious at the beginning, um, 
you should round out to develop your background environmental data. It's going to be easier for you to scale back your efforts than adding on mid-projects. But for the purpose of reporting progress, it's, it's advisable to round down for, for goals to allow yourself some flexibility um, as you better understand your concepts associated with the given project. So again, round out for data, round in for goals. Um, and here's another look at defining area. Uh, for those of us who have been doing mapping and evaluation projects for several years, we may be used to framing project work based on something that looks like what we see here in the top left, uh, these single map unit centric type correlation issues. But if we peel away at these issues, you're going to find they compound into a suite of associated and competing soils to address, as you can see uh, here in the second uh, picture on the uh, just right of that. Um, and now here uh, in the blue, we can bring in some other sources of in information on soil forming factors um, and ultimately arrive at something resembling what's seen here in the green, which represents soils associated with a given catena or in a specific geomorphic or physiographic context um, with some detailed soil survey scale type considerations. And this is going to be kind of our, what I, what I call like our provisional hypothesis on project extent, but I want to reiterate that it's always wise to round out well beyond an est estimated project extent. Um, and as you can see, this was done here with the uh, yellow halo. Um, and within that halo and in some of the green area as well, there's going to be some areas that are going to require further investigation to confirm if an area should or should not be associated with a given project. And uh, I want to make the case that the inventory and assessment can be done in conjunction with defining scope. And that also includes uh, compiling uh, our existing documentation, as well as reviewing property and interpretive results at different scales of different uh, database elements. And this will help us demonstrate the, the significance of the project that we're, we're doing. And lastly, I just wanted to say with this slide that uh, scoping a project is a brainstorming exercise. And in these early stages, there should be some active discussion between the project leader and the correlation team. And that may also include some key members of the technical team. So coming out of the evaluation phase, we should be able to identify the most significant concepts we need to describe the variability within the project area. And this will mostly begin like uh, um, with the concepts of taxons or component phases. But more generally speaking, uh, we can probably identify the most important lines on the landscape that divide our map units at the scales we are accustomed to mapping. And this is where we also uh, consider interpretive focus. And instead of resigning ourselves to what's been done in the past, they map this in Clay County, they map this and that in Sand County, we should really think about which units are really necessary to capture the use and management considerations for the customer. So continuing that thought from the last slide, um, let's consider how some of the most significant properties and diagnostic features will change across the project area. And this should also include some uh, geomorphic or ecological setting type information that help us define uh, our concept. And these features that we document here will ultimately influence how we approach our modeling. And here's an example of a part of a mapping criteria in a matrix form. So what's in this document here might resemble some information you could find from the, um, the old SIR documents or the series range and characteristics or even some mapping conventions. So as these provisional concepts take shape in the initial evaluation, we should um, also, uh, remember that this is a living document, and our understanding of concepts should evolve through the implement, implementation of, of uh, any MLRA project. So um, a solid list of potential covariates should be developed from environmental data early on in a project. And this is well documented elsewhere. Um, uh, in the soil survey manual, and again, in spatial data for soil mapping from the job aids. And um, it's also covered well in the trainings that everybody's taken 
But I just want to reemphasize the considerations of scales and processes when developing covariates, especially with the relief in hydrology covariates where multiple neighborhoods may be needed to address different scales. Um, and in brainstorming forming factors, uh, it should lead you to some new ideas that weren't envisioned in past projects. And so it's common for additional covariates to be considered at any point in the project as we know more about, uh, about our area. And one last note here, uh, not all useful environmental data is going to begin as raster data either. So think about how we have Sergo and gridded Sergo and realize that any point line or polygon inventory can be used as base environmental data um, for either um, model training or as covariates. So again, applying the score pan model is cited frequently, but uh, I want to reemphasize that explore, uh, in exploring this, it's, cr um, it's critical of uh, the early phase of any project. So if we have an exhaustive list of covariates, we can look to some known sources of pedologic knowledge to help us in narrowing down the list of most significant predictors, uh, or covariates, I should say. And a go-to source of soil knowledge can be, even can be our existing soil maps. And that can even be the Sergo that is subject to a, a given update. Or in an initial setting, maybe you're looking at an adjacent mapping area with some similar features. Um, but it may be useful to build some test models from Sergo properties and features. And by evaluating the relative importance of given covariates, we're essentially using the existing data as a springboard to help us significantly select the most significant covariates in shaping our sampling scheme that we're carrying forward. Uh, this is also a good point in the project to test your expert knowledge. Um, maybe I think that curvature and wetness would be the most critical covariates to predict uh, depth to bedrock in my area. But if we use depth to bedrock from Sergo, I might see that NDVI and relative position are more significant predictor variables. And we should kind of ask ourselves if that makes sense. So the final step in the development phase of the project may be uh, outlining a documentation strategy. And if we are going to use historical documentation or some data from partners, it needs careful consideration before using it for, uh, for modeling. But after that review, uh, our sampling for new data can be planned to target voids in geographic um, or covariate space. And while um, these more model-directed sampling schemes are, are prioritized in these projects, there should be plenty of flexibility for a second level of tacit knowledge to make um, any scheme practical and assure that you're collecting the right data um, in the right place. And stratifying your project area and finding areas of high opportunity should also be a priority. And uh, if there are access constraints or permission issues, this should be addressed at some level before generating any kind of sampling scheme. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of effort spent looking for offsets. And obviously, planning for investigations and characterization and soil properties should be emphasized in the early stages of a, of a project as well. So, um, so again, the field campaign should center on documenting the significant properties and diagnostic features um, that were outlined at the beginning of the project. And every member of the field team needs to document an identical data set at minimum. And while we may want to do a thorough pet-on description consistently, it's possible that even a set of satellite descriptions can document a more limited suite of information and still have a lot of utility in a modeling effort. So a sampling plan is going to have to weigh the desire to collect the most thorough documentation with the, de the desire to see as much of the landscape as possible. But regardless, we need, uh, we need a lot of care to assure that we have good, consistent documentation to generate any predictions that we do with a DSM-type project. So again, I'm going to skip over all the interesting parts of implementing a project, including the time in the field and the real work, generating the predictions. Um, I think others have some good experience to share. And um, as uh, 
as Chad and Suzanne said, this is the beginning of a series, and uh, I, I think we'll continue to see some good examples of applied work presented. Um, but I just want to continue to focus on the steps where correlation considerations are at the center of any process. And if anyone saw the presentation on the work in the Great Smoky Mountains last summer, the importance of correlation was really emphasized. And in these kinds of projects, your legend is going to continue to fluctuate throughout and also after the modeling phase. And it's not very likely that your provisional hypothesis on concepts or classes is going to ma match what uh, your results are, at least not identically. So right after the sampling campaign has been completed and before you get into generating any predictions, it's, it's a good time for the project leader to do a 100% quality control on the field descriptions that are going to be used for model training. And this really assures that all properties and features are consistently documented, and it allows us to reassess the criteria that's distinguishing each concept based on what, what's actually been observed. Your initial criteria might overemphasize taxonomy, either at the series level or above, but what was actually observed in the project area? And can your criteria be refined to better represent what was observed? Um, were there certain concepts that you observed in the field that weren't considered in your mapping criteria? Um, and then on the opposite end, maybe there were some concepts in your criteria that were relatively minor or not even observed at all. So, Taking all these questions into consideration, we can work to finalize our criteria and ultimately correlate each pet on consistently into a logical concept. So you might find a lot of taxi junks and family level phasing, but they're still going to inform your class concept and they're still going to inform your data population. But ultimately the goal is to correlate your points into those soil classes while representing similar soils. Um, so in reviewing the class criteria, it's, it's, it, it seems like a good fit for the correlation team meeting or maybe a, 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 a progress field review. Um, but this is also the point in the project where the pro project leader should consider beginning to build aggregated tabular data in NASIS. But the emphasis at this point is probably going to be on our more extensive soil components um, that we're pretty sure are going to be retained through correlation. So again, we're skipping over the predictions and going right to evaluating the success of our predictions and whether or not to proceed or go back and try something else. And I recommend beginning with a qualitative assessment of the results. Do they generally reflect our understanding of the soil variability in the project area? And from there, I, uh, I might do a simple cross-validation relating the field documentation to the predictions. And then for some more quantitative approaches, uh, reviewing out-of-bag air or residuals um, can help weigh relative success of, of several different approaches. Um, so to improve the performance of some soils, you're probably going to need to refine your methodology or consider a different variable. Um, but it, it also probably will become clear at this point that there are certain tentative raster map units that you're looking to model that may not be viable. So this is another step where applying correlation decisions should be considered. And it's common to have iterations of evaluating and reevaluating the success of, of our predictions. And um, it may be wise at, at some level to set a time limit uh, for, for modeling and review, though, just to continue to focus on the end product. If you have a, a project area with a larger, more diverse extent, you may want to consider dividing the area to evaluate success in different areas if, if that's some sort of a concern. Um, and now in the, to do a final validation, uh, typically with an MLRA field project, there might be a, a second field campaign. And again, it's important that the field campaign is designed to be practical and efficient. Uh, there's a formula in the manual, or there's a formula not in the manual, but referenced in the manual. Uh, for effort, estimating the number of observations for, for different thresholds of confidence and precision. And we've used that formula uh, to estimate our total number of observations needed for, for validating our, our maps. And typically we, 
may target a range per class as well. Um, let's say just for point of discussion, we're looking at between maybe 10 and 15 observations per class to validate a model. Uh, there will probably be some observation uh, or probably be many observations in some extensive concepts and, and fewer in others. But there should be some semblance of randomness to our selection of validation points. And again, the field descriptions must meet some sort of minimum documentation requirement to support or reject the match of mapping the concepts to modeling at a given site. We've had some good success um, in this region with getting together a field team to collect most of the documentation for a validation in just one week um, if, if access is, is addressed. Um, but the entire correlation should, or the, this is a good, a good step for the correlation team to be a part of. And uh, I, I think, at least from my perspective, this might be a good substitution for the field portion of the final field review if the quality assurance team is able to t take part in the, in the validation. And then after the field campaign and after the pedons have again been correlated, we can produce a confusion matrix. Um, and you may find if you have more than a handful of map units, there are some you didn't see as much as you expected, and maybe there are others that just didn't perform as well as expected. So yet again, here's a stage to evaluate our correlations and start asking some questions. Um, do I need to broaden my map unit concept to account for some of our systematic errors? Um, can the map units be distinguished from another concept in the model? And how close are your misses? Do they are they in associated soils? Um, ultimately, if you have some map units that can't be separated or are poorly discriminated, you might have to consider combining units yet again. So once this correlation exercise is done, the modeling results can be finalized. And in doing that, we register to gridded Sergo and resample the 10 meters to get the products in place, uh, Sergo and raster soil surveys to, to, to be able to nest together. And this is also the time to extract the results to the footprint where the modeling is relevant. And I'll get into this a little bit further later. But when the project raster has been finalized and an accuracy assessment data set is complete, we can begin uh, weighing different methods of accuracy um, and, and also reviewing our, our, our uncertainty predictions. But I'll admit some of the published projects are still uh, falling a little bit short on, uh, on reporting the different met metrics of accuracy and uncertainty. And this is probably an area that we still need to look at some more standardization. And I think that's recognized. So with our spatial data and documentation now finalized, we can begin to evaluate what was observed in a, in a more cumulative sense and develop a database to capture what's been observed, starting with our soil components. And we typically start with our correctly predicted pedons uh, to begin to develop component ranges and properties, layers, and diagnostic features. And with laboratory analysis always going to be more limiting, it's probably best to aggregate results for a suite of soils um, for context and data integrity uh, reasons. And that's, I'm sure, been done in uh, most projects anyway, anywhere. But What's unique about these projects is we have a pretty robust foundation of pedon observations, and we may have an opportunity to review data in a more quantitative sense. So this may be a good data set to look to to capture the true observed variability of our soils in the field. And uh, this could mean capturing 80 to 90 percent with our lows and highs, as, as that has been uh, proposed uh, elsewhere, or for some interpretation interpretive uh, groups such as texture may be looking at, at the modal value uh, to choose representative class. But anyway, after uh, the component library has been developed, we may want to look at our correlated pedon frequency per modeled raster class. And this should help us build out our raster data map units and evaluate which components are really necessary to capture a map unit concept. I've actually found the standard choices of mapping a kind are pretty applicable to raster soil surveys, um, minus the scale considerations. 
Um, there's almost a sequence with the math unit choices. And most projects um, I've worked with, the intent of a raster map unit begins as a con association with some strong soil landscape relationships. But ultimately, though, your con association should also show higher user accuracy, and the misses should mainly miss in similar or closely associated soils. A complex may start as a unit of closely associated soils, but it may also have begun as a con association and just achieved lower accuracy relative to intent. But maybe the, the misses are associated um, in, in the topographic sequence. Um, undifferentiated groups may be a choice where the model performance isn't very good and there's high uncertainty relative to intent. But maybe the map unit still represents something meaningful. There will be times where we won't be able to separate the similar soils that occur in specific areas but are not necessarily associated. And for this, I see undifferentiated is a, is a real good fit. Um, and then there's associations, which I have less experience with, but will probably have a lot of utility in our higher order modeling endeavors where the landscape, landscape or landform features or, or beyond are the, are the target of the modeling. Um, in updates, the raster soil survey extent is defined uh, from a single line that should be a, uh, seamless from Sergo, um, typically in conjunction with an MLRA update. Um, it, but in initials, it's, it's obviously going to be a diff, bit different in, in some areas. So uh, raster soil surveys are, are unique products from Sergo for sure. Um, uh, Sergo has the, the scale dependencies and uh, interpretive emphasis uh, inherent in it, but raster spatial and, da and tabular data should be able to complement our Sergo product. And raster data should be transferable to efficiently building SEMA Sergo as well. Um, and I think Sergo uh, ultimately can be addressed in the later stages of a, pro uh, of a project and can constitute a small fraction of the total time spent on a given pro project. Um, in some situations, circle line work may be reasonably consistent, and maybe some minor digital editing will, all, will be all that's necessary to apply our mapping convention seamlessly. But I find most update field projects are undertaken in part because circle line work and mapping the data are not consistent. And if this is the case, or in initials, you can use raster spatial data to aid and projecting the most important lines out on the landscape. In any case, the lines on the map should refer, represent these significant breaks that were outlined uh, earlier on in our project. And we can then go and analyze raster composition of each Sergo delineation to establish some paths to provisional mapping of concepts. And then as those concepts are developed, we can then take it a step further and develop our composition uh, for our provisional map units. Um, and on the spatial end, uh, I always recommend to offices to do 100% quality control review um, on any vector data that's produced um, from a raster soil survey project. Um, and in NASIS, hopefully we find that the soil components that we've developed for the raster map units are a pretty good fit with the components that we need for our Sergo map units. There's going to be some minor tweaks necessary for specific phasing, but hopefully, generally, the components are interchangeable. So this ends the major uh, correlation phase of the project. And certification and exports a uh, pretty well-worn well path um, that regions across the country uh, are, are pretty well comfortable with. So I'm going to focus on what we can do to correlate raster soil survey products consistent with what's outlined in the standards. And Again, as Chad said and Suzanne, um, these are still in development, but ultimately there's a path here to products. And then after, after I finish, Chad's going to discuss how we get those products out to the customer. So to finalize the project, we must compile the information to document the final correlation and certify the data. And I'll say this will begin with a lot of the standard project certification steps for a traditional uh, Sergo-like uh, update project, including 
correlating to legends, managing milestones, reporting acres, um, developing a project correlation document with uh, details on conversion legends and notes to company, uh, join statements, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of the standard final, final correlation documentation is really aimed at, at Sergo and our traditional vector soil survey product. But with rasters, I might suggest we take a different approach and really outline the major steps of the project that led to the resulting products. So um, we've been uh, drafting some correlation amendments to publish project data progressively to these state-level raster soil survey legends. And th these correlation amendments and developing them, we've looked again to the project management outline from the soil survey manual for a structure to do document the steps uh, and, and ultimately be able to retrace what's been done. Uh, there, there's an example here uh, attached uh, from a, a project out of the Fargo office. Um, and I'll say these process documents can be posted online, maybe. Um, and, and we're actually referencing, referencing these documents in the metadata to provide our customers documentation on uh, project-specific uh, uh, details, such as accuracy and methods. So again, raster soil survey legend management is going to be addressed in state raster soil survey areas. And we progressively correlate raster soil survey projects to the state legend upon completion. So basically, these projects will accumulate as they're finished and ready for certification in these statewide databases. So in this example of Minnesota here, we have four separate projects correlated to the Minnesota state raster soil survey legend. And in this example here, you can see four map units are associated with the Glacial Lake Baudette project. And they can be associated to the project through the overlap tables. Um, and in the raster soil survey legends, map unit symbols are no longer a matter of consideration uh, with, with the published symbols just replicating the national map unit symbol. Um, the final numeric value of a raster will repli be a, a replication of the map unit key. And this is identical to how it's provisioned in gridded Sergo as well. Uh, correlation to the legend is certified by the soil data quality specialist. And the export is uh, certified by the state soil scientist, just like a traditional non-MLRA soil survey area. And this outlines some of the considerations of a few of the early raster projects and how it relates to our, our soil business. And, and up to date and, and how we can apply this model right now. But again, all this is in its infancy and things can and will change quickly. So I'm going to turn it back over to Chad to get discuss getting results to the customers. All right. Thanks, Joe. Um, so there's, a, there's two components to, to a raster soil survey project. And that's the uh, you know, tabular and the spatial component. And the way that I had this uh, this uh, slide put together was to kind of show that there's kind of a wall between the two, and they are they're two separate um, components. And as Joe mentioned several times, the, the legends for raster soil surveys are maintained at the state level. Uh, and the reason this was selected is, was because it uh, reduces the burden of having to manage a raster class county county by county. Uh, which is the way that we did it with uh, traditional Sergo map units, and to get the uh, to get these uh, tables to you, the the export target is to Sergo, which will um, assemble the uh, the tables into the text files and email to them email them to the user so they can get imported into a database. The spatial data. Um, is generated as the result of the modeling effort, something that came from your classification or regression prediction. Uh, one thing to note is regardless of the resolution of your model, uh, we're going to be kicking it out in 10 meter uh, pixel cells. And, uh, for instance, you know, if you were, if you, the best data you could find was 30 meter Landsat and elevation, and that was what you used to generate 
your model, when you get done, you would resample down to 10 meters. And likewise, if you had you know, some super hyperspectral hyper imagery and the best LIDAR, LIDAR available at one meter, you would still have to, to resample up to 10 meters. Um, the reason this is is to be consistent with G-Sergo as well as uh, other uh, products such as the NLCD or the NAS CropScape. Um, and Joe also mentioned that these also have to align. You know, these all align to a common uh, extent so that the pixels overlap uh, one for one on top of one another. And the uh, all this lives together in, in every geo database, and that container is selected because it honors table relationships, existing tools work with it, uh, and that will allow you to get properties and interpretations out of it. And of course, it's familiar. These uh, individually by themselves, both of these entities, the Tiger and the spatial data, they mean nothing. They don't, they don't have a lot of meaning, right? These tables would be nothing more than uh, a bunch of random rows with some unconnected numbers. It's a really complex data structure. And similarly, spatial data would just be, you know, aggregated pixels on a the map. They don't really tell you anything. And in order to get these guys talking to one another, we use G-Sergo tools. And this should uh, really look familiar to most people because this is exactly how we treat our, uh, our vector information, right? I guess really the only difference is that our, our export target is to the staging server. Um, but I think what this should reiterate to you is the dependency of this process on NASIS. Or just to, another way to say it is NASIS is still the framework that we have to work in. Uh, these, like I said, these GIGA Sorgo tools, tools will combine these two entities so that they communicate with one another. Um, and that's really the... Uh, the whole crux behind the geographic inf information system is tying your information, your tabular data, to your location. And in a lot of ways, uh, I think we kind of might feel that this is unique to us, this building of a data set that we have to do. But I think really what it, what it points out is the complex nature of our database. I mean, we have to run tools in order to, to marry these guys together, whereas you know, well, I don't know if any of you have ever been out and had to, you know, build the data set that you've uh, acquired from a different data source, from the USGS or, or where have you. Uh, there's G-Sergo tools and, and uh, specifically the Sol Data Development Toolbox. We can under, under, uh, undervalue these tools enough, um, or overvalue both within the context of what they do for us here, but pretty much with anything that comes from WebSolar Survey. And you can find these tools on the G-Sergo homepage under the G-Sergo the Sergo Arc Tools bookmark. These tools are giving us the ability to create new file geodatabases, import the Sergo text files into tables, and establish the relationships between them so they can communicate with one another. Add in the output from your modeling effort, and you have a functional Rational Solar Survey database. Additionally, and very important to point out, is what these tools do offer is functionality that's very similar to what Sol Data Viewer did in terms of being able to ask a question and get results that you can see it on the landscape. Uh, these rational soil surveys live in two locations, and those are standalone state rational soil survey geodatabases like we have discussed, the state uh, associated with the state legend, as well as in uh, comprehensive national cooperative soil survey mapping databases, a new product that uh, has come out, I guess this will be the second year, is GNASCO. And GNASCO is a mashup of our, our currently three published products, which are Statsco, Sergo, and Rational Soil Survey. And while Statsco has complete coverage already, it's pretty coarse. Uh, and Sergo is somewhere between 80 and 90% complete. I, 
or has, I should, shouldn't say complete, I should say it has 80 to 90% coverage. Um, I don't think I want to be quoted on that. But in any case, when you merge all three of these guys together, you have a, uh, a seamless graded coverage of our best available souls information. And this, the GNASCO database, in my opinion, is a pretty significant step forward and allows for broad scale modeling using our data without requiring users to jump through the hoops to get these different databases to talk to one another. And this is our current inventory. Uh, the Rational of Soul surveys cover approximately 5 million acres with 3.5 million in Minnesota, about a million or so in North Dakota, and about 500,000 in Vermont. Sergo has about 2 billion acres, and Statsco is about 128 million acres. One of the, uh, the limitations of the Rash of Soil Survey is that it can't live within the Web Soil Survey ecosystem. And that means that you, know, you couldn't go up and ask for information in the web interface of Web Soil Survey. And web Soil Survey itself is, is a monster, and it's not just what you go interact with in a browser. Um, so you wouldn't be able to interact with it in a browser and similarly, uh, a limitation for a lot of people is that it isn't found on soil data access, which is kind of the behind the scenes API that lets you talk to Web Soil Survey from, from additional or outside applications. And where these guys are going to live, and I think Suzanne mentioned this, uh, is on the data gateway. And it's very important to point out that this is the only place, and within the data gateway, the only place that you can get to them is from the direct data download link on the geospatial data gateway homepage. They will not be found, you'll not be able to query for them using you know, the traditional map interface where it, you can set up a map AOI or you can specify particular counties. It's, uh, it just it isn't found there. And once you get to the, uh, once you enter the link, uh, you'll see an options for what the NRC, what the, the gateway is serving up in the box account. And you'd select the Soil Survey Geographic Databases and the, the GNASCO or the, the RAS standalone rasters are one option. And then there's two options for state GNASCO as well as a CONUS GNASCO. So that's where these guys live. Um, that's what I have for the export process. And I guess we'll turn it over back to the audience for anyone who has any questions. All right, I'll remind folks we'd like you to put your questions in the Q&A, and we'll address those questions. We already had several come in between the chat and Q&A. <clears throat> One of the first ones has to do with uh, the need for two legends. So it says the raster standards require initial soil surveys to publish in both raster and sergo. This means I have to carry two legends in NASA. Is there a way around this? Well, um, I have a very curt answer to that that some people will like and some people won't. But the way around that is to just publish a raster soil survey. But we recognize that we're not there yet, uh, and so the standards are written the way they are because, um, because of that. Because of limitations, uh, I mean primarily with delivery um, and user uh, you know, experience with the data. Uh, we can't put it in web soil surveys, so we're still tied to, uh, to also publishing a, a vector-based product at this point in time. And there's another question. <clears throat> What's the first training that you need to have to get started with Digital Soil Survey? I guess I would say intro to DSM or yeah. Spatial Analysis Workshop is a good place to start. Yeah, the, um, Chad's exactly right. The, 
Um, the DSM curriculum starts with the spatial analyst workshop and staff part one, both of which are prerequisites for the intro to DSM. Um, but the intro to DSM is where you're first really going to dive into the, um, the concepts and, and application skills of digital soil mapping. There was a question earlier in the chat, <clears throat> unless I heard incorrectly, waiting until the final field review to complete validation seems too late in the process. What do you say about that? Yeah, and I, I, saw, I saw that from Roger. Um, I, I, I think I, I understand his point there, and I, I'm, I might tend to agree. Um, but we've just, or just personally, um, I've, I've been wanting to participate in the, in the accuracy assessment in the field. Um, instead of having, you know, a more standard uh, field-based field or final review, um, we still have, you know, you know, final correlation meetings um, uh, with this as well, but um, they're just, they just haven't been field-based. And um, I added to Joe's comments in the chat that I, I think that there is validation that occurs throughout the process if there isn't some kind of validation going on as you're working through the modeling process, um, you know, that's not good. You kind of need to be checking yourself um, as you're going because it is an iterative process and you can't figure out how to improve, uh, you know, your model if you don't have some kind of way of kind of validating it as you go. Um, and there are several different ways of doing that. There are always qualitative um, ways of doing that. There are quantitative means that are built in um, to some of the different statistical modeling methods, um, such as cross-validation and things like that. So those can all be used kind of along the way. Um, and I know, Roger, you guys, I, I know how you approach things in your office um, with, as you mentioned, uh, kind of validating, you know, a certain parent material model and then moving on. But at the end, when you have your final map, we still need an accuracy assessment of some sort done on that final map because that's what is required to be reported um, in the standard. So uh, there has to be some kind of validation along the way, but at the end of the day, and I think what Joe is probably referring to is this you know, quantitative uh, accuracy assessment that gives us some kind of um, estimate of accuracy that we can then report as part of the requirements in the standards. All right, another question <clears throat> from Alan. On initial soil surveys, are we still required to publish Sergo vector format? Ron, can you repeat that? On initial soil surveys, are we still required to publish Sergo vector format? Um, <laughs> oh, this question. Yeah, it, it gets debated a lot, um, but right now uh, that's what is required because the only place that we uh, that we have a lot of access for users to our data is Web School Survey, which only ingests vector-based data right now. Um, I think that that is something that will change um, in the future as we have a, a better platform uh, for delivery of these raster soil surveys, you know, uh, an interface much like Web Soil Survey that has the same types of uh, of uh, capabilities, but we, we just don't have that in place right now, so. All right, we have time for one more question. <clears throat> we got several in here. Let's see the, uh, the question about uh, is it appropriate to have complexes and or associations in a 10 meter raster, and I'd say uh, yes. It, it is. I mean, there's there's going to be instances, uh, you know, 
similar to, to traditional mapping where you're not going to be able to refine your classes well enough based upon access constraints. I mean, if you're, you know, how many times are you going to be able to get to the top of a mountain to collect information? So uh, I think, you know, certainly the goal would be to create con associations or to, you know, single, single component classes for lack of better terminology. Um, but, you know, the flexibility to have to allow for them to, for complexes and associations is there. And Chad, I think I, I would add on to that as well that I don't see these as independent 10 meter cells. I still see these as as bodies of soils out on the landscape. So in that sense, there you know there there really could be um, complexes or complexes. right. And that and, and even though well, hopefully in, in the long run, even though you know you might feel like you fell short because you had to create a complex, you know one of the true benefits of the digital soil mapping, the, the product is that you're able to communicate more explicitly on the landscape where these complex sectors exist. So thank you, Suzanne, Chad, and Joe for your time and effort to make this presentation. And thanks to all the participants for joining in. We hope you found this information beneficial. We had more than 140 people join today's webinar. As I mentioned earlier, a recording of this webinar will be available on our NSC YouTube channel within a couple days. So please feel free to let your colleagues know about this training opportunity. This concludes our webinar presentation.